And then as we would guess, higher levels of estrogen tend to associate with leanness among premenopausal women, whereas obesity increases estrogen levels among postmenopausal women, likely due to increased aromatase activity in the obese adipose tissue. Regardless, given that the concentrations of circulating estradiol are magnitudes lower following the menopause, the higher ratio of androgens or testosterone to estrogens following the menopause is a major factor driving the adverse changes in the fat cells, despite elevated aromatase activity. In addition to the adverse effects of estrogen's loss on adipocyte metabolism, obesity causes adipose tissue dysfunction. So the more obese and the more full your fat cells get, the more dysfunctional they become. Hence, the combination of estrogen loss and obesity may be particularly problematic for aging women. Dysfunctional adipocyte metabolism leads to systemic metabolic dysfunction, including insulin resistance. This is because adipose tissue expansion during obesity creates a cycle of inflammation and lipotoxicity our fat cells become inflamed and somewhat toxic, likely due to the inability of adipose tissue to effectively store excess dietary lipids, leading to the ectopic distribution of lipids in other organs, i.e. the liver and the pancreas. We get fatty infiltrate. You've heard me talk about that before. Small adipocytes are highly insulin sensitive and protected against dysregulation of lipolysis, whereas a high concentration of enlarged adipocytes, so big fat cells that have been filled up, especially in the visceral abdominal region is associated with higher fasting insulin and glucose levels. This is partly attributed to hypertrophic adipocytes attracting macrophages. So what this means is the adipocytes of the fat cells get overfilled, like mentioned, and they start attracting immune cells. And so now they're inflamed. This leads to an inflammatory state characterized by the secretion of numerous pro-inflammatory cytokines and adipokines. These inflammatory cells enter the circulation, causing insulin resistance and adversely affecting blood vessels and organs. This contributes to the greater levels of systemic inflammation observed in obesity and aging. The failure of adipose tissue vasculature to expand sufficiently exacerbates the adverse sequelae of events that occur in obesogenic adipose tissue, which leads to local hypoxia and exacerbates the inflammatory state. So the vasculature can't keep up with the swelling of the fat cells. Interestingly, estrogen may be permissive to adipose tissue expandability, thus buffering obesity-associated inflammation. Mechanistically, this may be due to estrogen's ability to stimulate angiogenesis and mitochondrial activity in fat cells. So estrogen's protective to the fat cells. And then when the estrogen's gone, they don't have that protection anymore and they get really inflamed and pissed off and they don't get enough blood flow. And because they don't get enough blood flow, their oxygen is cut off and now they can't burn. And so now they can't unfill and it's a real mess. And the whole thing turns into a big insulin resistant dumpster fire. Notably, the adipose derived inflammation following the removal of ovaries in this study was in mice was the major predictor of insulin resistance, independent of total body fat. So just the inflammation of the adipocytes following the removal of the ovaries was the major predictor of insulin resistance, independent of total body fat. If you guys go listen to my series on Ozempic done right, and there's several in there, but if, just go listen to the first three. I talk about how some people's fat is more inflammatory than others and how it leads to more pain and how it leads to more inflammation. And so some people can gain five pounds and it's no big deal. It's subcutaneous. It's fine. They seem to have the ability to handle it. It's not a big deal, but some people gain five, 10 pounds and everything goes to hell in a handbasket and they start hurting really bad. Their blood pressure creeps up. Everything gets bad fast. This is why I don't think it's fair for people to judge and say, well, you only have 20 pounds. Why on earth would you try a GLP-1? That 20 pounds might be devastating to that person. And it might be as I've mentioned in multiple episodes all over my platform and my podcast, that first 15 to 20 pounds is the beginning of insulin resistance for many women. And this is where we want to intervene. We want to intervene early. This is why I said at the beginning of this episode, I think that GLP ones done appropriately in combination with bioidentical hormone replacement is indeed the middle-aged woman's BFF. I stand by that. 